Hello and welcome to this card games episode of our Aw Shucks previews video series. In a year where conventions aren't really happening and publishers can't demo their games with their hands and faces, we're here to digitally show off the games to you so you can get a handle on these exciting upcoming or currently available releases. Now, it's important to mention that these aren't reviews, they are previews. So we haven't even played the games we're talking about, we've just read the manuals to get the gist and show you what they're all about. And first up in our preview video about card games, we've got one card game and one not card game. Villagers, the card game, and Streets, the tile laying game, are two games in a series from Sinister Fish Games that come in these lovely slimline boxes. And even though Streets is a tile laying game and not really a card game, I thought that we'd demo them together to keep things simple. And we will start with Villagers. At the start of Villages, you are founding a village after a great plague, drafting people from this line of cards into your town to hopefully make something that is diverse as it is prosperous. At the start of the game, you'll lay out a road of villagers here, as well as prepare decks to go above it. You'll lay out a pool of coins to form the bank and some piles of publicly available villagers. In addition to this, each player will receive a Founder's Card and Village Square, as well as some coins and a starting hand. Now before starting the game proper, I want to talk about these Villager cards themselves. At the top of the card, you can see the suit they belong to, and below that, what production chain they will start or be part of. Below that, you can see the income these cards are going to generate, which is both a currency and also how you win the game. These padlock symbols show how to unlock a card, and these key symbols show what cards will unlock other cards. We'll get to all that a little later. And the last piece of information is this little card symbol at the top, which shows you how many cards you can slot on top of this one. So now I can talk about how the game is made up proper. It will take place over two phases, a draft phase and a build phase that will cycle over and over again until all these cards are gone and the person with the most coins is the winner. We'll start with the draft phase because it's nice and simple. All you'll do on your turn in the draft phase is take a starting amount of two of these cards from the road, putting them into your hand. I say starting amount because any cards you have face up in front of you with this little red food symbol will allow you to take more cards, one per food symbol, up to a maximum of five. And once you've taken your draft for the round, you replace any cards taken from the leftmost stack. Once drafting is done, we update the road by placing coins on any cards that weren't taken. And if those cards still had coins on them from the last round, they're removed from the game and replaced from the reserve. Then we move on to the build phase, which plays very similarly to the draft phase. On your turn in the build phase, you play cards from your hand. You start with a max of two, which you can increase by playing cards with these building symbols on them. And the way these cards work is quite interesting. Some cards, like this Lumberjack over here, you can just build on their own, but other cards, like the Wheeler, have prerequisites. You need to build them on top of existing cards. You'll notice these starting cards have two slots to be built on top of, and the subsequent ones only have one, so you're forming little trees of specialties. As well as this, you can always return a villager from your hand to take one of the basic villagers to form new trees. But quickly, you'll start spotting these locked cards from earlier, and how they work is kind of interesting. If I wanted to build this Freemason, I need to pay a brewer two coins, and note a brewer, not mine. So if an opponent has a brewer, I can pay them two coins to use it and unlock my Freemason. And if there's not one on the table, I can take that money out of circulation by paying the bank for some imaginary brewer. This is also your chance to play some of these red cards with cool special effects that you'll often discard out the game. This smuggler, for example, lets you gain half the gold value of a face-up card, useful if you need a little injection of cash. We'll keep doing this sequence of drafting and building until we get to a market phase, as noted by these cards on the bottom of these piles, and this is when we will score points. 
I say points, I really mean coins, because at this point, anyone with a face-up coin value in your village will score you coins, which you can then use to spend later on, or just keep them for those points at the end of the game. And the second market phase, right at the end here, when that's triggered, you'll score those silver coins, the end game scoring bonuses that'll depend on what you have in your village. And with that, I have basically described all of Villagers. It's a cosy, family-weight, tableau-building, card-drafting game. And I've got to say, I really love the production on this thing, with these little organisers for expansions and bits and bobs in this slim little box. It's very cute and very nice, and the art design, pretty strong as well. And with that, we can move on to the next game in this card games video that isn't a card game. The second game in our sinister fish em up is Streets, a game where players are investors trying to develop a new town. The player that makes the smartest investments and attracts the most people into their newly constructed buildings will be the winner. Each turn follows the same structure of building a building, scoring your streets, and picking a new building from the stack. Constructing a building is very simple. All you need to do is pick one from your hand and pop it into the streets in front of you, placing people based on what icons are on the tile. An important thing to note here is that you can place buildings like this. As long as the roads connect up in one continuous street, then you're free to place wherever you want. Once you've constructed a building, you get to place one of your little ownership tokens on top of it to show that it's yours. Now, eventually, someone might place a tile to enclose a street on both sides, at which point it will score. Each person on a building will give that player one dollar. Then we look at the specific scoring criteria on the top of the tile. This bicycle repair bar scores two dollars for every green family symbol on the entire street. In this street, that's four dollars. Once each player scores their building, they remove their ownership markers from them, ready to play on future buildings in future rounds. But one more thing happens. Any people that are on buildings that scored that round will try and move to similarly coloured symbols on other streets. And if they can't move to a different street, they will stand up because they've got FOMO. People that have FOMO will move to a building of that colour as soon as it's placed. So this person stranded on incredible daycare will move all the way over to this starter home as soon as it's built. What's interesting here is that by scoring streets, you change the value of properties in other streets surrounding it, potentially making those places more worth investment as the game goes on. And hey, I've basically explained all of streets there. You keep playing the game until the entire stack is depleted, at which point you'll have a massive sprawling town that's worth tons of money. At the end of the game, any unscored streets will score for half of their points, and whoever has the most money is the winner. But how about we make the whole game a little bit harder? Streets has two optional expansions straight out of the box, the first being the business expansion, which adds a set collection element. Essentially, if a player finishes a road, they get to take one of these symbols and place it in front of them, corresponding to a kind of building on that road. If you have the most of a symbol, then you earn yourself a $10 bonus. And if you have a set of each symbol, that's another $10 as well. And you can get, have as many of those as you want, so you can build your strategy deep or wide. The second expansion adds consultants, these unique player powers that you can pull out to add complexity and asymmetry into the game. For example, the contractor lets you build and draw two buildings on your turns, the renovator lets you build buildings on top of existing buildings, and the investor gets to double the value of one of their properties. There's also rules for a solo mode if you don't have the up to five players on hand, and that is basically all of Streets. Another lovely little production from Sinister Fish Games, and I'd quite like to give this one a try at some point. And that's it for these first two instalments of All Shucks Previews. Now let's move on to an actual card game. Up next, we've got a bit of a double header for you. We are looking at Fantasy Realms, the WizKids card game, and the expansion, Fantasy Realms, the Cursed Horde. This is new, this is quite exciting. It's quite an interesting game, this. Um, what you get in the base box is a riotously thick score pad and a deck of 50-some cards, all of which have 
Oh, it didn't work, did it? All of which have fantasy illustrations on classic fantasy illustrations of a type that I'm quite fond of. Now what players are doing in this game is they're all competing to create the best seven card fantasy realm. So setting up the game, by the way, is rather simple. Everyone receives seven cards. You put a draw deck in the middle, that's set up complete. Then somebody starts by, well, you're all gonna look at your hands and then on your turn, you're simply going to draw a card and discard a card. That's it. So perhaps I you know, draw a card and then I discard my Elven Archers. Um, then the next player, clockwise, is going to have an option of either picking up any of the cards in the discard area or drawing blindly. Perhaps they draw blindly and then go, hmm, decide to get rid of their lightning. But you don't create a discard pile in Fantasy Realms. Rather, all cards that are discarded create a sort of growing shop of cards for other players to pick up. And in fact, this is the timer on the end of the game. The game ends when there are ten... Three, four, five, six... Seven, eight, nine, ten. When there are ten cards in the discard area, that is the end of the game, and then everyone reveals their seven card hand, and you're going to score, see who has the highest score. Every card in your hand will have a point value in its upper left hand corner, but far more importantly, every card in this game combos with other cards in peculiar ways. So leaders and wizards might quite like horses and magic items. If you're gonna have a flood in your fantasy realm, you better hope you have a mountain or an island. Look, we've got an air elemental here that's gonna give plus 15 points for every other kind of weather in your fantasy realm. And we have a whirlwind that's gonna give plus 40 points if you have a rainstorm with it and either a blizzard or a great flood. So you can see that in creating a seven card combo in Fantasy Realms, you're also creating like a little discrete world. It's quite thematic, quite cool. You might have a world just absolutely rammed with wizards, and I might have a Fantasy Realm with hardly any people at all. Just incredibly terrifying weather. Now, you might notice that in looking at this score pad, scoring for this game seems very complicated, and yes, it is, which is why it's good news that WizKids has a free companion app for this game that you can download, punch your cards in, and it will just tell you your score. It'll do the working for you, um, but of course, career dweebs among you, like me, uh, will have fun using a paper and a bit of pencil. But then you're gonna wonder, Quinn's, what's this expansion all about? Well, I'm gonna tell you that's what these videos are for. If we shake, Bottom of the Cursed Horde box free from the lid. Oh my goodness, that's really stuck fast, isn't it? <laughs> Ooh, oh no, I've made a mess. So there's two modules contained in the Cursed Horde. The first one is the Cursed Horde. Um, so this is gonna complicate the game significantly because uh, when you play with the Cursed Horde, everyone at the start of the game is gonna have one cursed item face up in front of you. And this is like a special power that you can activate on your turn and receive that many negative cursed points. Once you've used an item, you're gonna flip it face down to show that you've used it. And then more temptation will come your way because after you've used your item at the end of your turn, you will receive a new item that you can optionally use. You also on your turn just cannot use this item and leave it in front of you or you can chuck it away and receive a new option. So that's gonna drastically uh, increase the possibility space and options in this game. Uh, I tell you what's also gonna make it more complicated is all of these new cards that are included in the Cursed Horde. If you choose to expand Fantasy Realms existing deck of 50 some cards with this 20 some extra cards, um, because you are diluting all of the combos in this deck, because obviously it's harder to make a nice seven, hard, seven card combo when you've got new cards that combo with each other in different ways, um, the moment you na, 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 fuse these cards to make Fantasy Realms a thicker, more complicated game, um, you've also just made the game longer and juicier because now players don't have seven cards and are working towards making a seven card combo. They now have eight cards at the start of the game and are working their way towards the best eight card combo. The timer on the game is also elongated. The game doesn't end when there are 10 cards in the discard, but when there are 12. Mm, really. You know, honestly, I like expansions that change a game, you know, but I also do like expansions that just expand it, you know, make it thicker, bigger, longer, heavier, denser. Mmm, mmm. I really do like an expansion, I really do like an expansion. Um, as with all the games in these videos, I haven't played this, I don't know if it's good, but I do know that being sat next to it for a while made me really, really want to try it.
All right, we've got a card game up for you next, um, but that's a bit like saying that we've got a bite for you to eat when I'm about to deliver to you a giant 24 ounce steak. This is Imperium, available as Imperium Classics, which is what I've got on the table, and Imperium Legends. And this is a radically asymmetric uh, game of civilizations clashing. Um, each box contains eight unique very, very different civilizations, and Imperium Legends contains the more complicated and spicy ones, whereas Classic, which I would, I think, recommend that you get first, contains some of the simpler factions, and you can see that all stored in this beautiful box with lovely translucent plastic. What we've got here on the table is a match between the Scythians, and this is their idiosyncratic setup, and this is the Persians over here on my right, and in the middle we have what will always appear in Games of Imperium, a kind of shop of stuff for your civilizations to smash and grab, or politely grab, basically you're grabbing. Um, over the course of this game you're going to be taking cards that are either going to go into your deck, or your history, which is kind of like hidden under your card, or your play area, all stuff that is in your civilization's past or present or future, and all of those cards that are in those three areas will get you victory points at the end of the game. However, there's another way this game can end besides the traditional triggers you'd expect, like decks running out. Um, this game can also end if everyone's civilizations collapse, and that happens if you run out of unrest cards, which generally are the cards that your civilization is going to get if it acquires stuff too fast and too greedily. Um, when this unrest deck runs out, um, the game ignores victory points entirely, and whoever has the least unrest cards in their play area is actually the winner. Um, so how do you play this game? Well, uh, I'm not, I'll, I, I will tell you the truth. This was the trickiest game for me to learn, not because the rules are necessarily complicated, but because it uses a lot of keywords in the manual um, to get around all of these factions playing so very differently. That also means I can't confidently teach you the whole game, uh, so instead I'm just going to walk you through what a turn might look like. So, let's start with the Scythians over here. Um, you're going to usually have five cards in your hand drawn from your deck, but this deck is going to change. You see, what we have here with these other decks is everyone's going to start the game as a barbarian uh, civilization. Uh, well, not, is civilization the right word? I don't know. Faction? People? Whatever. Um, but every time you run through your entire deck, which is going to be complicated by the fact that you're enlarging your deck by taking cards, um, every time you do that, you're going to grab a card off of this development deck. Okay, and that then is going to go in your hand as well. And this is more faction specific stuff. You have the faction specific deck you start the game with and the faction specific deck that you're going to be slowly adding to your deck every time you reshuffle and redraw. Um, and then also, once you've finally got all these cards into your deck, uh, most of which will be, you know, you will have gotten rid of it. Your deck will not look this thick unless you're doing badly. Once you've done all of that, then you are going to flip your civilization card. You're no longer a barbarian people, you are a empire. And that means that when you run through your deck again, you can go shopping for developments and shop buy cards from your faction's specific development deck. So you might have played games before where you start the game with a different deck to your opponents. Um, Imperium is that, but then also <laughs> you're going to sort of level up your deck with unique cards and then your end game victory point cards are also faction specific. And then when you add that, when you add the fact that you're probably going to be playing with different factions all the time, onto the fact that there is an incredible array of stuff for you to claim and find and see and do out in these shared decks, Imperium seems to be pursuing that kind of race for the galaxy vibe, where every game you play is going to be surprising and see you coming across different things and different strategies as well. So uh, I'll walk you through just in a bit more detail what a rough turn might look like. Oh, and I've made a mess of my skivians. So your turn in Imperium is often going to center around these little square tiles you've got on your card here. And these dictate a limit of how many cards you can play and also how many cards you have in play that you can exhaust. So for my first action of the game, I might play uh, Tian Shan here, uh, famous Scythian, and that has been garrison a card. So I'm going to take one of these rubbish unrest cards that I start the game with and just bury that under Tian Shan, so that means that's good. I've thinned out my deck immediately, and also I have someone here with a land icon, because icons that you have on cards often relate to other cards. For example, if I have a lot of land, then I have a card that lets me tax that land. It might make a lot of money. For my second action, I might put out some Scythian mounted archers who are going to keep me safe should my opponent try and attack me. 
Now look here, in my hand I've got two cards left, uh, and for the Scythians my options happen to be Advance or Conquer, and between the two of these, these both basically do the same thing. They let me spend resources in order to acquire different cards from the market. I feel like the Scythians are all about conquering, so I will use my last action of the turn to play the Conquer card, which is going to enable me to ooh, acquire cards or break through. Now these are two terms you see a lot in Imperium. Acquiring cards is pretty good because you get the card you want, but you often get the Unrest card that comes with it. In fact, the only cards that don't come with Unrest are just land, because if you've got land that literally no one is on, then that doesn't bother anyone too much. Um, but for me, I'm excited about getting a town, so I'm going to acquire this town. If I were to break through, I could just take the town by itself, or I could take the top card of the deck. But that's expensive, and I'm broke, so I'm going to acquire the town and Unrest, and both go into my hand. Now those two cards, obviously, I want to play my town. I'd love to play my advance as well, but uh, I've run out of the square action tokens, which means I can't do any more actions, which means my turn is over. Now at the end of my turn, I've got a nice foxy choice here. I can keep that town I want to play and that advance card I want to play maybe as well in my hand, or I could discard, well, I'm definitely going to get rid of the unrest, but I could discard one or both of these. Why would I do that? Well, because really this game's all about deck cycling as well. If I discard both of those, say, and say, well, I'll get around to that later, I have no cards. And that's relevant because at the end of your turn, you always draw up to five. So by discarding everything, including stuff I kind of want to play, I am getting closer to uh, one card left. I'm getting closer to having to reshuffle my discards to create a new draw deck, because don't forget, Every time I do that, I get a new special Scythian development, and that's going to go into my deck as well. And that will propel me on the way to becoming em an empire, turning from barbarian, barbarian to an empire, and getting access to all those juicy victory point producing empire cards that might otherwise um, be denied to me. Um, so, and you might already be seeing the problem here. By moving very fast, you're going to collect a lot of unrest and potentially collapse your empire. Um, but if you move very slow, someone else who manages to develop into an empire and get access to those victory point cards first is potentially going to kick your ass. Um, as you can probably tell looking at this, there are a tremendous amount of interesting decisions on offer. A tremendous amount of ways to play as well, and all of it is absolutely draped in the lovely art of... Aha! <laughs> I've, I knew I'd seen this person's art before. Mihalo the Miko Dimitrevsky, who has done, I'll say it, an absolutely bang up job. This is a gorgeous game, and I'm not going to be able to resist taking it for a little test drive once the pandemic is over and I can play card games with my friends again. Oh, don't get sad. Let's move on to the next game. This is Animals. In espionage, a tiny box game of what if spies, but also animalis. Now, this is a very simple little game of drafting, effectively, whereby there are six different animal spies, two of whom you're aware of, two of whom the other player is aware of, one of whom you're both aware of, and one that remains a complete mystery. Now, this only matters because you're running a spy agency and you kind of need to know who the good guys are from your perspective and the bad guys are from your perspective. Now this is how a game is set up. This animal is my agent and this animal is a spy and the same is true for the other player on the other side of the table. Each turn you're going to draw five cards and you're going to play four of them into two separate piles and the pile has to have one card. So I might go, okay this pile has got three owls in it and this pile has got five boxes in it. The final card you've got left over will be handed to the other player and then they will choose which pile to put them in and then choose the pile they want. So they might go, hmm, put the two foxes there and they're going to take that pile, I will take this pile. This becomes our intel deck. We sit on this for the entire game and it represents the points we get at the end of the game. Working that out is super simple. Owls are double agents, which means both players are going to get points for any owls they have in their deck game. However, for me, I need to be collecting <gasps> foxes. Every fox that I have in my deck at the end of the game is going to get me a point. However, I need to give to the other player lions. For every lion I manage to squeeze into their deck, they're going to lose points at the end of the game and they won't even know it, but perhaps they will have suspected. Meanwhile, they're going to be trying to feed me 
octopuses, I'm quite partial if I'm honest, and keeping to themselves monkeys. Spy monkeys, what will they think of next? At the end of the game, players are going to put down these tokens on the creatures that they believe might be the other player's agent and then flip them over and get points depending on how right they were and to what value. It's honestly an incredibly simple game and there's a couple of neat little expansions in here to mix it up including moles because you know it wouldn't be spies without moles and walruses. What did I do? Well moles as you might expect you want to try and get into the other players intel and walruses are quite cool as well. The double agent is secret at the start of the game and when you collect three walruses, you can then have a little peek and you know who the double agent is. Ha 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 ha. And that is animals in espionage, natural selection. Again, tiny little box, quite simple, quite colorful. It's got an octopus in it. Hey, this is cool. This is Four Gardens from Arcane Wonders, designed by Martin Dolezal, and it is set in... Oh, I'm going to use the term in the manual though, so I don't get in trouble. It is set in a beautiful eastern kingdom, and the queen of that kingdom is dead. Hooray! Because that means that one of the players is going to get to be the new heir to the kingdom, and they're going to do that by playing cards and rotating this... Da -da 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 -da! Amazing uh, three-dimensional pagoda. Now... Two things I want to tell you about this pagoda. First off, it disassembles super easily to pack back in the box. But also, um, I've assembled a lot of things in my time as a board game uh, reviewer. This is the easiest and most fun thing I've ever had to assemble. Everything just, just glided uh, onto one another and it was fun and it was like I was building with Lego or something. This was a really cool piece. Um, but the important thing to note is there are resources printed on the side. Mm, mm, we'll get to that. Um, four Gardens is a game for two to four players in which people will sit on different sides of the pagoda. So I've got a three player game set up here. Every player gets five cards to start the game with and a little resource holder. So that's player one, two, three. We've got a scoreboard here, some resources and a shopper cards. And what players are doing is they are racing to complete panoramas uh, using the cards in their hand. I'll bring some panoramas up on screen now. Mmm, don't they look great? Well, you can't have them until you have earned them. Uh, how do you earn them? Well. You are going to take turns going around the table until, depending on the player count, someone has played a certain number of cards. On your turn, you are going to do a total of three actions out of your five card hand, and every action requires you to either play a card or discard it. So you're going to go from five cards down to two cards, then you're going to fill your hand back up with these, and then play will move on. Um, so, uh, the first thing I'm going to teach you, the first action you can take, is to take one of the cards in your hand and say, I'm going to build this. I'm going to build this, or at least I'm going to try. Bop, and you put that card down, and that's, that's an action. Another action is to actually get resources to uh, then fulfill what this, these cards that you've put down require. So in this case, I need some stones. Um, that is going to be difficult, because you would assume, like I did perhaps, that what you want to do in this game is rotate the pagoda so the side showing the most resources is facing you. No, this game's meaner and harder than that. Uh, instead, you're going to play cards that show uh, which floor of the pagoda to rotate. And when you rotate that floor, you rotate all the uh, floors above it. And then you're going to collect resources either starting at the top or the bottom. So the easiest way to do this is to show you how it works. So if I were to play this card, which says rotate the second to top floor and then count up from the bottom left, uh, I would, uh, I'm going to cheat slightly to give this, make this a better example. Um, okay, so I would rotate that floor, okay. Uh, no, that's bad. Let's rotate the other way. Mm, that's better. Um, and then we're going to collect resources from the bottom going up. So I see two stones, which means I must collect two stones. They go in the first two slots of my little thing here. Then I get a grass, must collect that. Then I've got three wood. Oh, there's only room for one more word and I'm already full. So the two wood and the two water that I can see here, I don't get because I ran out of room first. And this is why it's potentially really not great to have loads of resources on your side of the pagoda. Um, so uh, of the three actions you can take on your turn, I've taught you one type, which is playing cards. I've taught you another type, which is rotate the pagoda and collect. That then goes in the bin. Um, I'll teach you another type. How do we get these resources from our incredibly, uh, cruelly small uh, resource displays onto the cards? That's easy. Every card has a little hand cart uh, icon showing every card in the game can be discarded to enable you to pick up any amount of resources and move them between all of the... Basically, you can take any resources 
in front of you and move them anywhere else in front of you. Um, the third, the final kind of action you can take is on some cards. You can play that card to take any resource you want and put it straight on a card. This is known as a wild action. Um, but what's really exciting is when you've completed these cards with all the resources, you're going to turn them over, na, 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 and the color in the corner is going to show you which god track you advance down. And this god track is um, meaner than you think. Um, so let's say I've played, you know, something that lets me move red and I am the yellow player. I'm going to move one step up the red track. So at the end of the game, I'm not going to get three victory points from the red god. I'm going to get four points. That's good. But what's even better is if you reach the end of a track. Um, so look, I'm going to get 10 points and my opponent's going to get three. If you get another advancement on that same color, you don't move up. All other players on the track move down. And if you manage to push them all the way off the track, they can never get back on it again, um, which really cracks me up. So if you push them all the way off the red track, not only will they get no points uh, from the red god, even if they play red cards, they won't get anything at all. So that's really cool. Um, also what's cool, if you complete a panorama, which you can see these dots at the top of the cards show where they go in a particular panorama. Um, if you complete one, then you get to take one of these uh, special bonus tiles, which is either um, a little slot so you can hold more resources or an immediate one-time payday of wild resources or just some victory points. You can just have some victory points. Can you just get that? Uh, the other rule to teach you is, oh wait, there's no more rules. Those are all the rules. It's just a game of hand management and trying to get resources and trying to assign them uh, efficiently in just surrounded by absolutely gorgeous components. Um, this is... I mean, I'm, I've only just started these preview videos, but this is the prettiest um, preview uh, video that I've filmed yet, uh, which is to say the game is pretty. I'm not, I'm not any prettier than usual. Um, lovely box with lovely spot UV. Uh, we've got these gorgeous cards. Uh, we've got this god uh, sort of track, which is prettier than it needs to be. We've got these lovely little wooden components. Uh, everything about this game looks nice. Everything about this game, I just said it looked nice and I didn't even mention this striking 3D pagoda that disassembles so very easily. And then it goes into an absolutely top class storage solution in the box uh, with slots for everything. How about that? How about that? That is four gardens from... <sighs> All the bits have gone everywhere now. That's four gardens from Arcane Wonders. In Sorcerer, players take control of unique sorcerers having a battle over Victorian London. At the start of each game, they will generate a unique sorcerer using different decks of cards, and then battle it out using minions and chunky handfuls of dice. Whichever player conquers two of three of these locations by the end of the game will be the winner. The first thing you'll do in any game of Sorcerer is super exciting. You get to create your own custom sorcerer. The way that you do this is take a character deck, a lineage deck, and a domain deck, and then smush them all together to create a 40 card character. Each of these decks comes with a unique skill card, as well as unique minions and spells, and they'll form a name when put together. Here I'm playing Zvrain, the Blood Lord of the Outcast Sanctuary, and my opponent is Tegu, the Necromancer of the Haunted Forest. You'll place the deck you've created on your own little player board in front of you and then set out the three battlefields you're going to be fighting over this round, as well as positioning your avatar ready to fight there. But before we get started on teaching the flow of the game itself, we should go through some of the components. These cards are your minions. They've got health, damage, effects, and a cost, as well as any special symbols kept up here. This card is flying, so it's more mobile and gives you an omen token whenever it's played. These cards are sorceries, indicated by this symbol, and are one-time use cards that do something a bit spooky. Cards that look like this are attachments, and they can be equipped to other minions, changing their abilities and modifying their combat values. We've also got a set of these chunky battle dice, as well as these interesting tokens. These omens can be spent during a battle to make an opponent or cause yourself to re-roll a single dice. And also, the first player token in this game is interesting. During the first player's turn, they can spend it and make themselves or their opponent re-roll a whole handful of dice. Very useful if used in the right situation. 
Once the game begins, we play through ready, action, and battle phases in turn until someone is the winner. And in the ready phase, we'll refresh any exhausted cards, as well as gain some energy on this track that'll let us take actions. We will either gain a set rate of four, or we'll roll this dice and gain whatever comes up on there. The first player gets to decide. Then we move on to the action phase, which is predictably where a lot of the game happens. In the action phase, players take turns taking actions, moving this little red bead until they've taken six each. Actions are fairly straightforward. You can take two cards, that's an action. You can gain two energy, that is also an action. The action phase is also where you can activate powers, like the ones found on your player card. But most importantly, in the action phase, you're going to be playing some monsters. You can spend the cost of a monster to play it into any battlefield that's in front of you. So I'm going to spend six energy to play this ravenous aristocrat in Southwark. There's a hard limit of four minions in any one of these territories, so as one of your actions, you might want to move them around. The reinforce action lets you move a creature or swap the positions of two of them at once. We keep going back and forth until each player is done taking actions, and then we move on to the battle phase, where we resolve each of these battlefields one after the other. The way these resolves is super simple. Each player takes it in turn, activating minions, exhausting them to roll their attack value in these chunky battle dice. Once you've rolled dice and activated any effects, the opponent can spend omen tokens to force you to re-roll. Any hits still outstanding will be dealt as damage to the other player's minions. Standard hits will be chosen by the defender, but critical hits are chosen by the attacker. As soon as a minion takes damage equaling or exceeding its health, it is killed and removed from the battlefield, placed in the graveyard. But instead of attacking minions directly, you can instead go straight for the battlefield, dealing damage to the location itself. If you ever reach all the way up to the top of this track, congratulations, you have won that battlefield, flipping it over and claiming it as your own. And if a player manages to successfully conquer two battlefields, they've won the game. So that's the gist of the game. Players go back and forth until someone has sufficiently demolished enough of London. But what's exciting about Sorcerer is the unique aspects of each character and deck. The Hellfire Cult have flame counters that deal persistent damage, or the followers of Usir can manipulate the graveyard in interesting ways. The Keepers of the Progeny have a whole blood system they can mess around with, and Oberon's Kingdom have a bunch of spiders. So mixing and matching these decks of cards is the core joy of Sorcerer, finding something that works and laughing when something doesn't. But alongside that, there are plenty of other ways to play Sorcerer with more than two if you're into that. There's a Battle Royale mode, or you can play it in a team format. And alongside that, there are plenty of ways to expand Sorcerer if you're hungry for more. So that is Sorcerer, an interesting little card battler deck builder combo from the same publishers that brought you Star Realms and Hero Realms. This is Rocket Men by Martin Wallace, published by Phalanx Games. It's a deck building game, a competitive one where you're trying to get rockets into space. Now, as you can see, this winding track here represents the path that your rockets are hopefully going to take up into the cosmos, and you're going to be getting points by sending different projects out into space, depending on how far you can actually manage to wing them. Now, first of all, we've got all of your favorite planets here. We've got Earth, the big blue original wet one, Mars, the dusty fella, and everyone's favorite planet, the moon. There should actually be a token here for Mars token, moon token, Earth token. My Earth token fell on the floor and I simply cannot find it. So I can only apologize for that, but just imagine there's a piece of cardboard there. Now at the start of the game, each player is gonna have one of these little boards in front of them and they're gonna have a starting deck of some basic cards. And these are the same cards that are going to allow you to send different types of thing up into space. Spaceships, orbital shipyards, satellites, and my particular favourite, the Space Hotel. All of these different elements you can also see around the board here. And this is a little reminder of how much it's actually going to cost you in terms of rocket power to get these different things up into these different areas. So here it's quite cheap to get satellites up into Earth's orbit, or so I keep hearing. Moon, bit pricier, and when you get to Mars, well, Mars is going to reward you for the big stuff like bases or asteroid mining. 
Now if we take a closer look at some of these basic starting cards, you'll get more of an idea of how the game is played. So you can see here, a satellite is only really useful for Earth and the Moon, and it tells you here the amount of rocket power you're going to need to get them up to that area in space, but also the amount of cards you're going to get to then draw from this cool booster deck. But you can't count your chickens until they're in space, and that's when things get a little bit more expensive. This area of a card just in the top left corner tells you what a card is worth in terms of when you're playing it. So a satellite is worth 10 bucks. Seems cheap. That's useful because it's going to cost you 10 bucks to place something on either mission control or the launch pad. Now, this is pretty simple. If you want to send a space hotel into space, then you would put that onto mission control. That would cost you $10 to do that, but this is worth $10 already, which means it pays for itself to be put there quids in. And this basically is an intention that you're going to try and send this space hotel into space where it arguably belongs, but it's not going to get very far without any fuel. And that's why you're actually then going to add more cards to your launch pad, again, costing you $10 per card that you're placing in the hope of then accelerating that through into space. And that's where these little symbols come into play. Effectively, there are three types of different special resources that you're going to use to either buy cards from the shop, of course there's a shop, it's a dick pole, I'll come back to that in a second, or to accelerate you through space. So you'll see getting to Earth, microchips, for every microchip item that you have on your launch pad, you're going to get to move an extra space when you actually eventually have your launch. And the same is true for vials of chemicals and good stuff on the moon and for DNA based magic when you go to Mars. And if you successfully land a mission or one of these locations, you're going to get a bonus as is pointed out in the bottom of these cards. And these are basically these little tiles that you're going to collect. And some of them are just going to give you permanent buffs for the rest of the game, allowing you to just go a bit further with your engines. Some of them are going to be things that you can spend every turn to get one of these resources from nowhere or get some extra cash out of nowhere. You just remember you hit it in the back of a rocket and buy some more stuff in the shop or put some more stuff on the launch pad. Because I've talked about the launch pad quite a bit, but the other half of this game is buying cards from the selection of things down here. And there's some interesting stuff going on here in terms of the fact that, yes, you've got some fun stuff like hedge funds and backup systems. I, I've admittedly chosen two things that don't sound like fun, but there's there's a whole bunch of sciencey stuff here that's quite cool. But you've also got problems that you can buy. Things like climate change. And if you buy that, it's going to be worth victory points at the end of the game. But it's quite expensive to even to, to buy climate change. I think arguably the idea is that you're dealing with it. And you can't really use it for much afterwards. The thing is, though, as well, they get more expensive as the game goes on. So there's a bit of an encouragement there to try and get stuff early and get the most out of it. You've also got engines that you can buy, which are going to be fantastic for helping your rocket get further and further into space. And finally, and I think this is a really a fun, <laughs> neat thing. Finally, do you remember right at the start, I pointed out that some of these cards had a little number of boost cards you got to draw? Well, when you're actually running the mission, you're going to add up all of the stuff from your cards and move it along. And then you're going to get that many cards you can draw from this deck. And you're just going to flip them over and see what numbers you get. So this is seven for three cards. That's pretty great. I would move another seven spaces up here. However, you might not. The, the distribution of stuff in this is such that actually that was a pretty great draw. And there's a nice little neat rule in this in the fact that you can call off the mission at any point until you've drawn that last card, which means you can keep pushing your luck. But if it looks at the last minute like you're not going to make it um, <laughs> into space, or at least where you want to, then you can just cancel the mission and everyone can go home. Finally, there of course, as you would expect, are bonuses for being the first person to get to Moon, first person to get to Mars, Moon. It's, it's the Moon. And also to be the first person to uh, launch specifically these individual things into these areas. So it's a little push your luck deck builder with a lot of space and sciency theme. Finally, I will point out that there is, should people be into this sort of thing, uh, a variety of miniatures that are available as a sort of side thing. Instead of having uh, plain colored tokens to put on these things, you can, you can have these things and put them into space. If that 
is your kind of thing. And that is Rocketman. All right there, me old barrel of onions and pickles. It's a game set in London town. This is Nancy Narking, a game designed by Martin Wallace. And quite a strange box, if I'm entirely honest. This is a redesign of Discworld, a game that's out of print, and I believe this is of a limited print edition as well. Retheming that game in Victorian fictional times. And what I mean by that is it's quite strange. Yeah, you've got Sherlock Holmes. You've also got Karl Marx and Victor Frankenstein. So there's a lot going on here and there's a lot going on here. This of course is London Town and this is a pretty simple game which you play with cards. Now, before we get carried away with socialists and monsters, we should have a look at the actual core mechanic of the game. This is an asymmetrical game that involves area control, buying buildings and possibly also assassinating each other. Now, there's a bunch of different characters in the game, all of which have their own unique criteria on how they're going to try and win the game. Some people are going to want to be dominating areas by just having more people there than others. Some people are going to want to be amassing lots of money. Some people are going to be want to building loads of buildings. And some people just want to cause trouble. Two to four players are going to be spreading out across this map, fighting for control of things and trying to stop the other people from winning. And it makes very clear in the manual that it's crucial that you know all the ways that other people can win uh, so you don't let them win. Classic technique when playing any game is try not to let the other people win. Now across the board you're going to see quite a different variety of different types and sizes and shapes of pieces. In the basic game you don't need to worry about that. There is a module that basically mixes it up a bit with each of the building types and each of the unit types of characters and agents that you can play on the board have different effects and people have special cards that let them do specific things with these different types of things but in the base game it really is just a case of playing agents into areas on the board moving them around and causing each other trouble how you do all of the different actions in the game is pretty simple it's all from cards now each card you play is effectively going to allow you to do a bunch of different things from that card Mr. Myrtle, for an example here, allows us to do a variety of things. This little man in a top hat at the top means you can play an agent and you're on the board. So I just choose one of my little characters and I can put this into an area that either already contains one of my agents or in an adjacent space to one of those. So in this case, I might pop down to Ooh, Battersea, maybe. I'm a big fan of Bermondsey. I'm going to go for Battersea. The next thing I'd do would be to take some money, three money for me, fantastic. I'm pretty sure these cardboard coins will be accepted as legal tender within the UK soon. And then this little scroll symbol here means that we're gonna carry out the special action at the bottom of the card. Take two cards from the draw deck. Finally, and crucially perhaps, this last little symbol here allows us to immediately play another card. Now, if you're savvy, it means that you can chain things together and do a whole variety of things in one turn. The crucial thing though is almost all of these actions on a card are optional. You can go down in order and choose to do them or not to do them, with the exception of whenever this awful little bird appears, you must immediately take one of the random event cards that are going to appear during the game and play it and carry it out. Crucially though, these things can only happen once per game, which means you can't have things repeatedly happening and some bad surprises might occur, but they won't happen again. Now these things can substantially change the city, bringing in, for example, grenadiers into town who just cause dramatic amounts of trouble or even just a big Zeppelin crash, which is just going to completely take out everything in an area. Not ideal. And if we can just pop back to Dr. Frankenstein for a moment, maybe we're a bit concerned about the prescription he's written up for us, then we'll notice the little hand sign there. It may not surprise you to know that this is the kind of game where you are going to be able to play cards and go, ah, I'm assassinating that small boy. But additionally, there are also cards that let you block things from happening and all of that stuff. It's a fast paced card based thing where you are going to cause people trouble. Other things you can do, for example, in addition to, I already spilled the beans, assassinating people are getting the police involved to stop trouble. 
trouble as a mechanic in this that occurs whenever you have two people. Any two people in one area, that's trouble, according to um, this version of London. Less trouble from you, all right? Also, in the realm of this might not be a surprise, we have got a dice which you will find yourself rolling during the game to decide where bad things happen, when events happen, or to decide whether or not somebody lives or dies. Here, roll a die. On a roll of 7 to 12, you remove a pawn of your choice from an area containing a trouble marker. Charlie Peace. Not really living up to the name there, Charlie, but we'll let you off just this once. Additionally, you've got different areas on the board, cost different amounts to plop a building down, and each of these has a card, and these cards all offer you actions that you can take each round. I can activate the East End. I can tap Holborn. I can uh, use the power of Battersea. I can uh, bend Lambeth to my will. There's honestly, if you are a fan of old school London or old school London characters, or just anyone who was in a book or a story from, uh, I can't even remember what era this was, Victorian, I guess a hundred years ago, history. It's hard then there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. And the game keeps rolling on with people placing things and causing trouble and getting the police to, to make trouble go away until somebody manages to win by getting their criteria just right. At the start of their turn, they'll win. With the exception of Sherlock Holmes. If Sherlock Holmes is in play, then they win just by the game running out of cards. If you draw all the cards from the deck, none left, nobody's won, then it's Sherlock has won, which is quite fitting for a man who is evidently quite smug. And that is Nancy Narking. Apogee puts you in the shoes of a spacecraft mission director, tasked with developing your very own rocket. During the game, you're going to be recruiting engineers, designing technologies, and building a beautiful space boy to win contracts and secure yourself the victory. The game is all about using your team of engineers to take actions to best build your rocket, and each mission of the game is going to task you with a different goal. In our game, we just want to get as far as possible with our rocket, but in other games, you might be designing something for a specific purpose, so with that in mind, let's get into it. At the start of the game, each player will get a director and the opportunity to buy some starting engineers for 40,000 space bucks a piece. Uh, you'll then take a peek at all the starting technologies available in this bank of techs over here. We will play a number of rounds, and each round has three phases. A planning phase, where your engineers take their actions based on what slot they're put in at the bottom here. A launch phase, where you'll launch your built rockets. And an admin phase, where you collect some money. But the first thing we'll do is reveal the event for the round. In this game, our first event is inaccessible premises. All engineers' specialty actions are not allowed during this round. And you know what? We're going to ignore that, because I'm teaching you the game, and I don't want you to get confused. But just remember that event will be there. In the planning phase, we will place engineers face down into these slots, and each slot is gonna have a different effect when these cards are revealed. The specialty slot is gonna activate their specialty, construction is gonna let you build, R&D will let you develop, and conception will let you get new technology that you can build in future rounds. Now, when you resolve these actions, you'll resolve it based on the ranking of the engineer in the slot. So if I had a 7.6 here, but my fellow player over here had this 10.4, then they would resolve the action first, followed by me. And that's how turn order works for each of these slots. These actions are very straightforward to resolve beyond that though. So specialties, you just do what's said on the card in turn order. Uh, I won't go over what those actions are here because they're slightly complicated when you don't know about the rest of the game. Uh, construction is the next action. Construction lets you build as many pieces as you have engineers. So I've got one engineer in construction, so I can build one of these pieces that I had, I must have it in my reserve already, into the rocket. The R&D slot will let you take a card from the top of this R&D deck over here. And these are other kinds of tech that you can slot into your rocket right at the top that all have special effects. And the last thing you can do is go to this conception space. And that is how you get these technologies that you want to build in the first place. Starting with the highest player, you'll take a card from any row that you fancy and you can put it up on your player board, which you can then later on build into your rocket. Note that you can only ever take one card from this action, even if you commit multiple engineers to the space. Having lots of them in this space, all it's going to do is increase your likelihood of getting the card that you want. 
once we are all good and done with that, we will have a launch phase where if you have built a rocket like this, you can throw it up into the skies and hopefully be successful. Here, we will consult this chart to work out how well the rocket performs, referencing the total thrust and the total mass that we have on our rocket. We've got seven mass and five thrust over here, so if we take it over to this performance thing, we can find out seven thrust and five mass. Oh, 1.2. That's quite pathetic. And then we cross-reference this with this launch probabilities grid. So 1.2 will give us a roll of five or more will let us land on Geo. I initially looked at this and was quite scared, but it's really quite simple. It just boils down to the fact that if your rocket is light and powerful uh, up here, it can go further easier, which is quite simple when it comes down to it. But now let's have a quick look over here at these uh, planets that we're going to go to. So we were going to try and go to Geo, and we needed a five or more, so we'd roll this dice, and we completely failed. <laughs> if you rolled a success, then the launch worked, and all the rocket tech returns to the reserve. If it's unsuccessful, the rocket doesn't go anywhere, and you get to keep all the tech on your board. Once everyone has had a chance at doing some space, we'll have an administration phase where everyone gets funds determined by their mission director. And you'll also get funds if you completed uh, investors' objectives like these examples up here, and if you managed to land on planets. And lastly, players can then take an extra action. They can recruit another engineer, they can sell their existing technology for funds, they can activate their specialty on their director, or they can use their special nation power. We'll then check to see if anyone managed to do the mission objective. We're on mission seven here, so players just want to get as far as possible at the end of the eighth round. But different objectives will ask different things of you in each game. And there's plenty of things I didn't get into the weeds of here, like compatibility in the rocket and making sure all your pieces all line up, or what the special effects of R&D pieces are, or how the mission directors specifically change things. But that'll all shake out over the course of your first games of Apogee. Uh, this one is available from DTDA Games, and I, I really like the art design and theme here and this core of building and testing rockets sounds lovely uh, and this is available on tabletopia so the reason i've left the teach nice and skinny is because you can go and figure it all out by yourself you can see what joys await you like nuclear thermal rockets how exciting if you're into your games of space investments then it might be high time to invest in apogee a game all about space Up next, me and my absolutely just ridiculously large Sports Direct mug. What is happening there? Are taking a look at Big Easy Busking. This is published by Weird Giraffe Games and designed by Joshua J. Mills. And what we have here is a card game and an area control game for one to five players. That's right, solo mode included right there in the box. Um, about leaving it all on the street in New Orleans. Everyone's going to get their own band. So how's that for a hook? You just get your own band if you choose to play this game. Um, I've got a two-player game set up here, a blue band versus a yellow band, all right? And this is a game of basically managing each of your band members' energy. You are going to be trying to assign energy cubes from your band to different areas of New Orleans, and you're going to get a bunch of money if you get enough cubes on each card, but the person with the most cubes gets some extra cash, and you're going to do this for three rounds. In the first round, there's three areas to compete over. Second round, there's four. Third round, there's five. Fourth round, there's no fourth round after that. You just see whoever has the most money. Um, so let me walk you through a bit of turn structure here. On your turn, you can basically either learn a song or play a song. So if you choose to learn a song, each one of your band members is going to lose one energy cube. And then you get to pick one song from the shop or draw blindly from the top of your deck. And that will get added to your hand of songs that you know. Alternatively, you can play a song. And what that means is you select a song from your hand, you put it next to wherever you're playing, and then you're going to assign the energy that that song requires from your band members. And not all songs are created equal. Some songs are just absolutely giant saxophone solos and some involve, you know, team effort. Um, then, at the start of your next turn, there's a nice bit of thematic flavor there, um, the song is only finished playing at the start of your turn, uh, you're going to check something. You're going to check if the vibe of the area where you are playing fits the vibe of the song you're playing. And if you are, that's great. That means you've got options. You can... Uh, either move all of the cubes from that card onto this area you're trying to control, and if you do that, you get a dollar, uh, a little bonus dollar, or you can mix and match. You can leave some but not all of the uh, energy cubes on that area if you want to finesse the area control and move them back to your sheet. However, if the vibe of the song you're playing doesn't fit the vibe of the area, that's fine. You just have to move all the cubes onto the area and you receive no dollar. 
after that, you have an interesting decision to make. You can spend money, which is victory points in this game, uh, to restore your bandmates. You can spend one dollar any number of times to get any number of uh, cubes back to your band. Presumably by buying them um, PG-rated beignets and not getting involved in any of the stuff that musicians usually uh, like to like to have. I'm getting sidetracked. Um, so what you're doing here is just trying to manage the energy reserves of your band members. You're wondering when to acquire new songs to give you more flexibility in future rounds, when to play songs and try and take control of places. Also, I'll just draw your attention here to three standards that are randomly dealt out every game that everyone can play because everybody knows. However, they require additional energy and every time someone plays them once, you're gonna flip that over so they require two additional energy. Goodness gracious. I really like the theme of this game. I've not seen anything quite like it and the mechanics all interact with it in a way that makes absolutely perfect sense. This is Planetary Control by Kerberos Games. And if you've ever wanted to take an alien world by force, then you're a weirdo and welcome. So what we're gonna be doing in this game is, you guessed it, taking alien worlds by force. And gosh, have we got some alien worlds for you. I can't read this upside down. I presume it says sausages. Uh, no chance. Durandal, Nikishini. I'm not going to continue to try and read upside down. The key thing is we've got these six different planets and we're going to be trying to take them with our forces which are going to be matched on cards that we're going to be drawing. So effectively this is a card game of suits in a way where you're going to be choosing the right time to try and play some high cards in the hope of seizing some of these planets. The tricky thing is that every time a planet gets taken back and forth from different players as it will throughout the game. For reasons that no one really understands, the population of that planet is going to go up. And at the end of the game, the winner is going to be the person who has the most collective population on the planets in their control. So when do you want to try and swoop in and take Nishini? Well, that's on you to decide, Nishini. I should be locked up. Now, in addition to these suits of cards that you're going to be drawing throughout the game and holding on to in the hope of seizing a planet at just the right moment, you're also going to have some special cards which effectively let you do slightly irritating or protective things. I could play a colonize card, which would just let me take a planet that's in my control and add five population to it. Dum, 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 dum those people sure have been eating their greens. I could also do some horrible things like just drop a nuke on a planet and wipe everybody out. But thankfully you can also play a shield to protect against that and all sorts of other things. So after I've taken this planet for my very own, I might sit it in front of me and be very happy with that. Oh, a power of 10. That's going to be hard to beat. Of course, somebody might play one of these cards that assassinates one of my cards, which is not ideal if you've only got one. And there's all sorts of other stuff you can do. You've got two full reference cards here of things you can do with Spec Ops characters. You can add additional troops to the planet. You can assassinate cards off of planets. You can drop nukes on things and completely destroy them. You can also bubble shields around your planets to protect them from that happening. And all sorts of other things. You can play as many of these spec op cards as you want during your turn, and apart from the card that lets you block a nuke from hitting you, there's no back and forth and take that. The key thing is though, again, you can only invade one planet per turn, and the way you take a planet from another player is super simple. You just simply look at the total value of the cards that they have on that planet and beat it. So I could put down this green 10 here and kick them off, or if I really wanted to hold onto it, I could put down maybe a 10 and a nine and say that is definitely mine. At the end of the game, the person with the most population total is the winner, and there's gonna be a card kind of at the bottom part of this deck which simply says cease fire on it, which means everyone goes, oh, there's gonna be a cease fire soon, one more round, and the game is over. And that, in a nutshell, is planetary control. Popcats Fighter is a head-to-head -head arena game where players will battle it out by playing cards, building combos, and utilizing their unique special abilities. Every game of Popcats Fighter starts by setting up character boards, and each player gets their own unique character and super move cards. And over the course of each individual game, each player is trying to use cards from the move deck to form combos and deal damage to their opponent, hopefully knocking them out of the arena. 
the last cat standing will win. We will play a number of rounds, and each round has four phases. Attack, defend, energize, and resolve. We'll perform combos first, defend against them second, and then resolve the damage dealt. In the attack phase, players will play cards from their hand into their combo lines in front of them, making sure to link the cards together. You can link a card by playing two cards in a row that have the same symbol, or the same colour, or both. You'll want to link a lot of these together, because the more you link, the more effects you'll resolve and damage you'll do. Players also have access to two super move cards that they can play in the middle of their chain to start it afresh, as they have neither a symbol nor a colour, crucial for getting all the way up to here. And as well as that, each super move has its own unique effect. Now, your opponent might be eyeing up this ridiculous chain and getting a bit worried about their limited health pool, which is where these block cards come in. In the defend phase, your opponent can take the bite out of your combo by playing block cards. These come in two flavours, symbol or colour blocks, and when used, they can take out all of one colour or symbol from your chain. In addition to this, the defending player can also exert some precious energy to remove particularly spiky super moves. We'll then enter an energy phase, where the attacking player will gain energy based on the values printed on their cards. A vital resource for getting the most out of some of these attacks, and it can be spent instead of a block card in a pinch. And then, finally, the combo is resolved, and the opponent will take damage according to the total hits scored. You'll also deal hits for reaching certain combo spaces on your board here, so it pays to chain combos for as long as possible, so that even when you're blocked, you're scoring these bonuses. On top of all of this, there are eight different fighters to choose from that come in the box, and each one comes with their own set of super moves and their own set of perks. These can be spent by flipping these chunky button tokens on your player board and resolving their effects when they apply. And regardless of what fighter you're playing, each one has access to Raging Furry Mode, a one-time use ability at the bottom of their player board that'll score them a one-time bonus of energy or cards when they get particularly low. But once a fighter reaches zero health on their player board, it's game over for them. They are eliminated from the game, and the player that took them out will take one of these gold coins. It's best of three, so two of those on your player board means you have won. So that is Popcat's Fighter from NinjaBot Studios, a fast and frantic game of building and breaking combos. And you can look out for its Kickstarter campaign later in 2021. What might this be hidden in the Digivoid? It's Ida Smarti, or Edis Marti, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's all in Latin, but it translates to the Ides of March, in which players are part of the Roman Senate, entangled in a secret conspiracy to serve up hot, hot murder on the old Julius Caesar. You're going to be choosing a side, finding out who your fellow conspirators are, and getting your schemes rolling, but some of your fellow senators only care about money, just like in real life. We've got a six player game set up here in Tabletopia and at the start of the game each player is going to be given two of these faction cards. These are either going to be loyal which is green, traitor which is red, or merchant which is yellow and these will be kept secret and face down for the rest of the game. And the starting player will be given this console card and the starting player is determined by whoever most recently held a knife and they'll give the praetor card to the player to their left and these Edil cards to the next two players after that. Uh, we're going to play two rounds total, and each round has as many turns as there are players. So let's talk about each turn. And what's going to happen here is that these two Edil players will take vote cards and choose one of them to play secretly in front of them. This player might choose a red card, and this player might choose a green card. This will all be done secretly. We won't see it. Uh, the Praetor will then choose one of these cards to have a little peek at. Whoop! And then they can make that player decide to swap that card. They might say, no, I don't like that. You're going to swap it with this one. And then they have to do that. It's forced. And then once that happens, we will score. We will reveal the two vote cards. And these will move the tracker towards kill or not kill Caesar, depending on which they voted for. So this will move this track bap, bap, to towards not kill. If the token ever passes the player threshold, so for a six-player game, that's somewhere down here, uh, we will 
proceed to the end of game steps. Regardless, after this vote, the console for that turn actually bins one of their allegiance cards, locking in their faction for the rest of the game. So they might decide to bin this merchant card. They don't want the merchant faction to win anymore. They want the good loyal boys to take the victory. Now, once we've gone round the table completely, each player will just have one faction card left. And at this point, something interesting happens. The console, the first player, will assign these roll cards at the start of the turn rather than them naturally going to the players to their left. And whoever gets picked uh, to be the Edil will also get a third kind of vote card. Look at the thumbs up, the thumbs down, and this neutral merchant vote. These are blank votes that will not advance either faction token. Uh, now, the game will end when one of two things happen. Either a faction token passes the player threshold, so here, six in a six-player game, or the starting player receives the console card for a third time, which is effectively timing out the game. These endings are called the failed conspiracy ending and the Ides of March ending, and we'll go over what each one means. In either case, each player is going to reveal their faction card, revealing their allegiance for the last round of the game, and then we'll work out who wins. Uh, in the case of a failed conspiracy ending, what we call it when one of these tokens exceeds its threshold, the rival faction to that faction will win the game. Uh, but if there are players of that, if there are no players, sorry, if there are no players of that rival faction around the table, then it is the merchants who will win. Anyone with those gold? Wait, has anyone got a gold card? Oh. Oh, they wouldn't win. The other ending is the Ides of March ending, the timeout ending, and the faction with two or more votes than the rival faction will win in this case. But if there's a tie, or if only one or more votes uh, manage to pass, then the merchant faction will also win the game there. They have maintained the status quo. Uh, so that is Idas Marti. Idas Marti, I don't know how to pronounce the Latin name. And I can imagine a ton of table talk and guessing and tense decision making in this small box social deduction game. Uh, it's available from Two Tomatoes Games and it seats up to eight players, I believe. And that's that game. Very nice!